good morning to our friends here in the conference hall and also to those joining us online. My name is Walter Mead and I am the Ravenel B. Curry III Distinguished Fellow here at Hudson Institute. Uh, today it is really my great pleasure to host my friend and neighbor, France's Ambassador to the United States, Philippe Etienne, for a discussion on transatlantic relations and French foreign policy. And because France, like the United States, is a global power with global interests and also a power that, like the United States, uh, has a kind of an ideological as well as a realist component in its foreign policy, I think hearing from the French ambassador is particularly instructive and useful for Americans. And the French capability to develop sort of independent insights and fresh vision is one that I think all Americans, whether or not they end up agreeing with these French perspectives, would do very well to take into account. And uh, Ambassador Etienne is, is remarkably well qualified to uh, fulfill this important diplomatic and uh, I would say even intellectual role. He's one of France's most experienced and distinguished diplomats. He assumed his current post in September of 2019 and he served in numerous positions within the foreign ministry uh, for Europe and foreign affairs, including the ambassador to Germany, diplomatic advisor to the president, director of the cabinet of the minister of foreign and European affairs, permanent representative of France to the European Union, as well as having served as ambassador to Romania. So Ambassador Etienne, thank you very much for joining me and for sharing some of your time with us at Hudson Institute. Hudson, by the way, Hudson Institute is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization uh, based in Washington, D.C. Uh, while Hudson has uh, many research projects and other things, I think, and, and Hudson Institute itself takes no formal position on political issues. I think it's safe to say that Hudson overall is an institute that is committed to a strong American role and believes that. Uh, success, American success in foreign affairs is crucial to world peace, American security, and it cannot be achieved without the alliances, that, alliances around the world, of whom obviously our oldest alliance with France is one of the most important. So, Mr. Ambassador, Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine was, was one of those rare events in international affairs that one could call genuinely shocking. Uh, how has the invasion impacted Europe? Well, thank you, Walter. Thank you very much for your in invitation, but also for your introduction, <laughs> both about France and about myself. It was a shock indeed for all of us, uh, but uh, for Europe, it means um, the comeback of war to Europe, uh, a flow of refugees, more than 10% of the population of Ukraine, uh, now on the territory of member states of the European Union. It's something which never happened also since World War II. So it's not only a shock, but it's also a historical change, which means uh, it must also, uh, it calls for historical decisions on our side. And uh, maybe we will discuss this later, but we have taken these decisions especially relevant for France, since France is uh, right now the chair, the rotating chair of the Council yeah. of the European Union. But for all of us in Europe, it's, uh, and I think, around the globe, because it's both, of course, something happening in Europe, but it is also a global event. So the two dimensions are very important. Uh Given uh, that the war has disrupted supply chains, had uh, raised concerns over energy and food uh, supplies, not only in Europe, by the way, but in many other countries around the world, uh, and we have, as you say, both the refugee problems and the security problems, uh, what are the principal concerns of European policymakers at the moment? We have both short-term um, priorities and uh, uh, longer-term concerning the effects of this war. Uh, the short-term uh, priorities were to react, to respond strongly and in a coordinated way with our allies and partners, including and particularly the United States, of course, 
to the uh, unprovoked invasion and brutal and invasion uh, of Ukraine by Russia. So it means um, both sanctions and which had never been seen uh, concerning such a major economy like Russia. It means, and, and, and sanctions increasing, uh, we, we have already adopted five rounds of sanctions. It means supporting Ukraine on different levels. Maybe we'll come back to this. For first time in its history, the European Union is providing funds for the member states, for its member states to send weapons to another country. Uh, it means also welcoming the refugees and providing a, a, a very large humanitarian relief to, to Ukraine inside the borders of Ukraine. It means also, um, uh, of course, um, uh, handling the very close relation with Ukraine on the political side. We, our, our president, like the American president, like other heads of state, speaks uh, constantly with President Zelensky, uh, including in, in terms of uh, seeing how we can accompany his uh, negotiation, which is so, so difficult with the Russians. It means supporting Ukraine from an economic and macroeconomic and financial point of view. We, we must not forget this because it's a war, but it's also uh, a, a terrible uh, time for the Ukrainian economy, which must send. It's part of the resistance of Ukraine. And on all those uh, levels, uh, France and Europe have been present. On the longer term perspective, I thank you for reminding us that the energy and still more the food dimensions are more, maybe still more relevant outside Europe than in Europe. Well, the energy dimension is crucial for Europe, both because we have to decide on sanctions uh, against Russia, but also because uh, the prices of energy are going upwards, like uh, here in the United States or worldwide. Uh, but the food dimension is uh, really global and uh, threatening other countries. And it is also politically something we must keep in mind. Uh, as you know, we have um, very much campaigned all around the world to condemn the Russian invasion in the United Nations. If we want to have the support of the other countries, the other continents, we must also, of course, take their own concerns into account. And for many of them, this, this dimension is very important. So uh, France has proposed a plan, a global plan, to uh, prevent uh, and uh, also to, to alleviate the, the dimensions of this war on, on the food situation. And these consequences are the direct consequences of the war, of the invasion, not of our sanctions. It is also a very important dimension in our own narrative. Now, this is, this is very important, and I think it has been somewhat under undercovered, maybe, in, in the press, that um, while Europe has a problem with both supply and price, if Russian oil disappears from the market. In the US, it would have problems with price lower and not so much with supply. There are many other countries in the world that could not pay the higher prices uh, if the price of energy continues to rise. And we could see political instability, um, con direct consequences of this war spreading. Uh, already in Sri Lanka, we see something that almost approaches a, a social meltdown over rising fuel and food prices. So the, the, the crisis of this war may have only just begun to, mm -hmm. to impact. Do you see differences you know, sitting in Washington and obviously following news here and, and in Europe, do you see differences in the interpretations of the war or events on the different sides of the Atlantic? Or are we looking at it more or less the same way? I would say we are looking uh, at it the same way, basically. It's, uh, it's both uh, from the, part the, 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 the origin, which is clear. It is uh, an uh, unjustified uh, aggression uh, by Russia. It is also a blatant violation of the principles and of the Charter of the United Nations. Uh, uh, we, we see now another dimension, which is uh, uh, the, 
massive uh, violation of hum international humanitarian law and uh, uh, atrocities committed, uh, which are uh, more crimes. And um, uh, maybe uh, you've seen it is a new dimension of our support to Ukraine. We have uh, decided as France not only to support the investigation by the International Criminal Court, to support politically, financially, and with our expertise, but also to send our investigators to Ukraine to help the Ukrainian justice. So it is a new dimension, and unfortunately, of this uh, support we give to Ukraine after the atrocities we have, which have been discovered uh, after the Russian army left the, the northern region, the mm -hmm. north of Kiev. And so I could uh, see I could quote many other examples where I think we see the situation the same the same way. Of course, the, the difference being that it's much closer to us than to the United States. But I think the U.S. sees exactly as we do this uh, war as a, 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 a major threat to to international security and to and a major violation of our basic principles. Um. One of the responses we've seen has been new conversation about uh, the potential place of Ukraine in the European Union, uh, something that would be a massive step uh, for the EU. I think sometimes people underestimate the, the difficulties and the costs of integrating mm -hmm. a country like Ukraine, even absent the Russian security threat, with the EU. And historically, the French have been skeptical I think about, and maybe that's unfair, but you can tell me skeptical about the prospects for this. Is how is that seen now in Paris? Well, thank you for the question. Indeed, I don't think we we are skeptical uh, about the idea of enlargement in general. Mm -hmm. But France has been among the countries who've said historically. I will come back to Ukraine after that. Look uh, before accepting new member states, the European Union must be in a capacity to do it. And so we have usually two sets of criteria. Are the candidate countries ready? Because to become a member means a lot of things. And is the European Union itself ready? Yes. So we have been among those who have said, Don't, let's, let's not forget the second set of criteria. This is uh, why we have, uh, in the last years, succeeded in changing the enlargement, pro the negotiating process once we have decided to open negotiations with what we are doing now with some members in the Western Balkans. This being said, and as uh, we have already said it, this war, this aggression, this invasion is absolutely a game changer, of course. It changes the history of our continent. So we have to take seriously the signature by President Zelensky of an official uh, under the, the bombs of the Russian army, so to say, to request officially the accession of Ukraine to the European Union. It is something really um, more than symbolic. We must recall that the European Union and Ukraine are not on a, on a, on a, on a blank page. We have an association agreement already, which is quite important and, and substantial and structural, which covers all fields of relations. And interestingly, it is this association agreement, which more precisely the fact that under the pressure of Moscow, the former president Yanukovych withdrew his support to the signature of, the signet of this agreement, which provoked, which, which uh, unleashed the protest by the Ukrainian people on Maidan, on the Maidan yes, Square in yes. Kyiv, you remember, in 2000, at the end of 2013, beginning of 2014. So there is already this history of uh, okay. the association of Ukraine to the EU being a close, a very, a very meaningful and delicate part of its evolution, and including from the point of view its relation with Russia, its neighbor. Okay. Now, once the French presidency of the European Union has received this uh, request, official request this time of accession, we have decided, together with the other leaders, we met, they met in Versailles one, one and a half months ago, two things. First, to transmit, it is the first step of the pr process, immediately, without any delay, the request to the European Commission, which according to our treaties must assess 
what gi must give an assessment of the of the candidature. And the second the second step will be the Commission giving its assessment. And you know that maybe Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the European Commission, was in Kiev and yep. discussed this with President Zelensky. And the second thing the leaders decided in, in Versailles was to say. Ukraine is part of the European family. What does it mean concretely beyond the association agreement and the process of the request for accession? It means very practical things beyond even this support of Ukraine, which I described earlier. I will give you only one example. We have succeeded, which is a technical prowess, in, some, uh, in a matter of weeks to connect Ukraine to the electrical grid of the European Union. Mm. Before that, Ukraine was connected to the electrical grid of Russia. So we, this idea of uh, Ukraine being part of the European family is both something symbolic, of course, but it, it may, and both po political, but also very, very practical. And uh, you can be sure that uh, we will follow this. Considering also, and you, you must not forget, that we have Western Balkan countries, which are not yet members of the European Union, which have been recognized as having the vocation of being members. Some of them are engaged in enlargement negotiation, access, accession negotiations. So we have also to take this into account, mm. of course. Yep. And again, for uh, Americans who may be following this, uh, it's uh, for the EU accession, it's not just about the additional Mm. costs of integrating economies where the uh, per capita income is far below or the level of development is different from, from that of most of the EU, but also European institutions. If you have 27 members, it's different from a union of six members. If you were to go to 35 members, everything becomes more complicated, even the number of translators that exactly. have to, have to tran give simultaneous trans translation from, you know, from Finnish to Romanian. Uh, it, it's, it's a very complex process. So uh, Americans uh, should be aware of just how, how great a change it is for Europe to be moving in this, in this direction. Yes, uh, uh, not many people understand that. Thank you for saying that. But at the same time, again, this war is a game changer. So we, the European Union and the European integration will have to adapt themselves to right. this. Now, there also seem to be a lot of big changes taking place in Germany. Um, Germany in its own way, perhaps less rapidly and less fully than some European countries is accepting that something historic is happening to its east. And we see Germany talking about raising defense spending and, and beginning to change its approach to arming Ukraine and so on. Uh, how does that look from Paris, that change? Oh, it looks positive, definitely. Uh, it means, uh, indeed, uh, considering the, the size and the influence of Germany in Europe, uh, it means more possibilities, and it goes together with other countries evolving. Denmark deciding to hold a referendum in, uh, in, in June, I think, I'm not sure, about the end of its ex exemption mm -hmm. in terms of participating to the foreign and security policies in the European Union. Uh, you see the debate in Sweden and Finland. Yes. Uh, uh, concerning their statute of neutrality and uh, their relations with NATO. Uh, a lot of uh, other examples, uh, countries which would never have considered uh, sending weapons uh, to Ukraine, uh, in, to another country at war. All of this is happening really. Uh, and I am often asked whether I was surprised by the very, very significant German decisions. Uh, and being the representative of France, and you ask the right question, <laughs> because I am not the representative of Germany, I have still my history, personal history. I was ambassador in Berlin, and I remember that uh, at the end of 2015, when France was attacked by ter the terrorist groups from Syria mm. in, the, in the heart of Paris, we asked for the solidarity of our other member states of the European Union. And I was at that time in Germany, and I remember very well the par parliament in Germany met immediately and on a proposition 
of the German government sent, decided to send military assets to help us against uh, this, uh, the ISIS uh, yep. group which had attacked us. So I was not surprised in terms of when something really important happens, we European nations, including Germany, in spite of uh, the uh, history and the fact that uh, after World War II they decided not to, to have another orientation, all our Europeans, they rally. They rally because when something essential is, cons is, is, is at stake, collectively or even for one of the countries, the notion of solidarity and adapting to, to, to big crises is there. So, no, I was not cr really completely surprised. But yes, it is a, 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 positive, a positive move for the whole of the European Union. Great. Well. Um we can, we can talk forever um, that about uh, Ukraine and the changes in, in Europe that the war is causing, but again, like the United States, uh, France is a country that thinks about other parts of the world as well as its immediate neighborhood. And I, I see that Human Rights Watch has described a recent massacre in Mali as the worst atrocity in Mali's decades-long armed conflict uh, with French troops having withdrawn and with, I think, not just Mali, but, but across much of Africa, um, just rising jihadi violence and, and one could say even general civil breakdown of a number of countries. How does France look at this problem in an area where historically French influence has been critical? Well, in Mali, I'm not sure the only violence comes from the terrorist groups. No, no, no. Uh, actually, uh, I mean the last incident. Uh, but uh, indeed, it is, it is the Mali, Malian government who called France in 2013 uh, the French army uh, on the decision of the previous president, François Hollande, came to rescue Mali, while the jihadist groups had already conquered, conquered the, half, the northern half of the country. Yep. So we stopped this uh, and we um, helped the Malian army to liberate its country. But the jihadist groups, not only ISIS, but also Al-Qaeda, remained there and in the region. So we, we, we have decided to uh, withdraw our army from Mali because the, Malian, the new Malian authorities uh, who, are, who came after two successive uh, military coups were not um, uh, interested to have uh, the French army anymore and we are there to uh, only to, 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 to help countries which request our help and to help their armies. At the, at the end, the idea is that they will be empowered to, to, to do the job themselves. But we are still engaged, we are not withdrawing from the whole region. On the contrary, we said we, we, we remain in, in Sahel uh, we extend our cooperation to the coastal Western African countries mm -hmm. because you see uh, how these jihadist groups try to also expand their activities yes. uh, into those uh, coastal uh, countries of Western Africa. And uh, we are more than ever engaged with Africa as a whole, including the African Union, to do more in terms of empowering the African nations and their regional and continental organizations to be, to have, through the help of the United Nations and our, our uh, countries, uh, to be more and more in a position to fight themselves efficiently against uh, those uh, uh, threats, both militarily, directly, but also to address the other effects which are as important. Just one example, once you have freed a region from the terrorist footprint, if you want them not to come back immediately after you have left yourself, you need to bring back education, you need to bring back first police and security, but also to bring back education, schools, health care, uh, public services in general. So this is as important as a military aspect. And we will continue to remain very much committed to also this civilian, also strategic civilian aspects uh, to help the Sahelian countries. Um, of course, the, the Wagner Group has been active in uh, Mali as well. Um, and looking maybe at the Middle East, um, where France has had longtime interests in countries like Lebanon and, and Syria, uh, where we've seen in the last 10 years sort of heartbreaking levels mm. of 
violence, in some ways worse than anything Ukraine has yet experienced, and the economic and social breakdown in Lebanon is, is one of the tragedies of our, of our time. Uh, some of that, not all of it, but some of it has reflected Russian power in the region and the expansion of Russian power, particularly since about 2015. Uh, does the conflict in Ukraine and the new economic difficulties of Russia, do you think there are any opportunities or this could have consequences and there might be ways of bringing a little, something a little better out of the situation there? I don't know. Uh, obviously, you have uh, people thinking that um, uh, Putin will need to, 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 to bring some of these uh, forces he has in other parts back to, to, to the war he, he yes. has started against Ukraine. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure we have still an assessment. What, what, is, what, what, what we know is a, is a reality, is what you said, that Syria, the Syrian crisis and the way it, was, it has been handled has given a huge opportunity to Russia to yes. come in. Uh, and in, indeed, we are, as France, much engaged uh, in, in here too, like in, in Sahel or in Ukraine, in close coordination with the U.S., especially as you know, in fighting against the same terrorist groups, but in Levant, uh, in north, yes. north yes. northeastern Syria and Iraq, it remains a challenge. We must not forget this. And since you mentioned Lebanon, to um, uh, especially after the terrible explosion at the port of, of Beirut. To, to, to really uh, try to support the Lebanese people and to push <coughs> it, its political leadership, uh, especially in view of the next elections which are uh, coming up, to, to introduce the reforms to, to make this ex unique model of coexistence, which is Lebanon between different uh, groups, uh, again successful. Yep. Now that would be heartening. Do you th there's been talk of Putin bringing troops, not only Russians, back from Syria, but bringing Syrian fighters back to Ukraine. This surely would be um, an escalation that would be deeply unwelcome in Europe to see these fighters in, in a European country with their records of atrocities and the brutality of that war. Is, do you think NATO or the EU might have some response to this? I, we will see. Um, wh what we have said is that we are really um, uh, monitoring very closely the different types of escalations which can happen in Ukraine. Another one you, 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 we could mention it being the use of a, a chemical yes. or biological uh, weapons. And we've said it would, the latter would draw serious consequences, of course. And, uh, but to enlarge your, your, your last question, uh, I mean, the use of mercenaries is more and more widespread from some regimes. Yeah. We've, we've seen that in, in Libya, we've seen that, uh, you mentioned the Wagner uh, in Central African Republic, now in Mali. And um, it's, of course, uh, something which we have to take into account, which is a worrying development of uh, uh, of the way to, 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 to come in crisis and to, to try to weigh on, on situ national crisis situations. Yeah, yeah. Um, still in the Middle East, the, uh, the JCPOA, I, I think of it more and more as the Schrodinger's cat of diplomacy. <laughs> you, it's in a black box and some days you think maybe it's alive and some days maybe it's dead. Uh, what's uh, France, of course, as a member of the UN Security Council, is one of the countries involved in these negotiations and has frequently played a critical role in JCPOA negotiations. Where do you think this stands now? Well, I would say more than frequently. Since the very beginning, France, since the very first contacts with Iran uh, nearly 20 years ago, we have been working uh, uh, without... Um, Counting the <laughs> our work, our hard work, we, we we together with in particular with two other European countries, uh, Germany and the United Kingdom, we have worked very hard to 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 get to a, a settlement preventing uh, Iran to get the, the nuclear bomb, of course, and this is the reason why 
uh, when the new administration said uh, it would be ready to consider mm. coming back to compliance if Iran, of course, comes back to compliance because Iraq, Iran violated itself uh, the JCPOA uh, after the U.S. withdrew from it in 2018. We we have. Once the new administration makes this decision, we, we have worked very, very hard in, in, in Vienna to get back to this result. We have reached, a, after a number of uh, progress in the negotiations, uh, a situation where this decision is not really anymore in our hands, as you know. So we, we consider that it's uh, the best way to, to, to reach the result I mentioned already, which is the strategic goal we have together with the United States and others uh, not to have uh, Iran in the possession of a nuclear bomb, but um, we, we are waiting, as you said, for the decision which has to be taken by others. It does seem that, that the final issue may or may not, because you can never say anything is final in this negotiation, may be whether or not the uh, IGRC, the Revolutionary Guard, is delisted um, from the list of foreign terrorist organizations. The sanctions are lifted against that group. From a French perspective, do you, I don't know that the French have a perspective on it, but is that, would that be an appropriate? It's really not our discussion. Yeah. Because uh, we, uh, we, we, we have our own determinations on, uh, on the issues uh, linked with our relations with Iran. And uh, we, we know it, those relations, uh, even for, for us, are not, uh, are not simple. We had uh, our own developments uh, in Europe, as you know. But it's really not our decision. And we respect it's, um, it's, uh, it has to take place. Uh, I, I, told, I, I gave you our assessment on the agreement itself and yeah. uh, our positive we would not have worked that much to get to this possible result if we didn't think it, it, it would be a positive development in terms of uh, non-proliferation. Yeah. Um, then let's move on uh, geographically a little farther to the Pacific, where France, as someone who has visited Tahiti and spent euros in Tahiti and uh, uh -huh. discovered that folks in Tahiti actually speak much better French than I do, which is not difficult. Um, France is a, an Indo-Pacific power. What, how does France see its role in this, um, in this increasingly critical region of the world? Well, first, thank you for mentioning that we are an Indo-Pacific uh, power, which might have been uh, lost uh, <laughs> or forgotten <laughs> in some corners here at some points. But uh, we, uh, thanks to the French uh, territories in the French Polynesia, Wallis and Futuna, and uh, New Caledonia, uh, but also the island of La Réunion in the uh, Indian Indian Ocean. Ocean. Uh, France has uh, an, the second largest uh, exclusive maritime zone after the United States in the world. So we are quite uh, interested, to answer your question, in the stability of the region and the security, but also in, uh, in um, uh, the respect of the principles of uh, freedom and um, uh, free maritime circulation and uh, all, all those principles which are so important everywhere in the world, but uh, quite a lot in this region, which is so important for uh, the global stability, but also for the global prosperity. So we, we see ourselves uh, first as a, as a country directly interested because we are present in the region, we have forces, we have, of course, populations, we have to protect them, directly interested in, in, the, um, in these aspects. But also as a European country, which is there to attract the attention of the other European countries, which, are, which have not the same reasons to be directly involved. Mm -hmm. but we, which are interested, of course, by trade, by, by right. the protection of environment, biodiversity, as we are. I mentioned environment and biodiversity because they are survival issues for those regions, especially the island states, mm -hmm. which are directly threatened uh, in their own survival by the, the rise in the, in the level of the ocean. So th the other European nations have been uh, now, have b became aware, and I think France has played a role in this, 
in such a way that Germany, the Netherlands, and other European Union as a whole has, have adopted, after France, their own Indo-Pacific strategies. And this is the base of our consultations with the United States, of course, and with other nations uh, of the region uh, or interested in the region. I see there are, are elections scheduled for Australia in the next uh, few months, and at least according to the polls, there might well be a change of government in Australia. Do you think uh, uh, Franco-Australian re relations might begin to recover? I will not speculate on elections, neither in France nor in <laughs> Australia. <laughs> uh, we, we work, we work... Uh, of, of course, course you do. <laughs> we, we, have, we have our own... Uh, 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 we had our own strategic partnership with Australia, which was, of course, uh, upset by uh, what happened last September when they decided to, to walk out of this, um, the basic feature of this, um, which was a submarines contract with a French and an American, by the way, company. Right, which, right. Uh, so uh, we have to reconstruct this, uh, and we, 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 we need to, indeed, to, to have uh, serious conversations for this. I think that both uh, France and Australia not only have a, a, an evident interest, if you consider, for instance, how close, <laughs> into, I mean, all, all, all distances are huge in this right, right, region, but, yes. but if you look at the map of the Pacific and uh, we, 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 you see hmm. what it means for, for Australia, like for f the French territories. Yeah. Well, and the, the, so we... We, we need to, 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 to rebuild this uh, uh, strategic partnership as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah. one looks at something like the, uh, what, the potential agreement that might see Chinese forces having a right to be in, this, in uh, the Solomon Islands uh, as a, something that would be of almost equal interest to France and Australia, of equal concern. Yes, you see strategic changes all over the place, the, yep. all around the globe, but uh, this region is, in particular, is so strategic. Coming back to uh, Franco-American relations, uh, what do you think is, and, and this might, might be a difficult question to choose from so many, but what do you think is the single biggest misunderstanding Americans have about France or French foreign policy? Um, I would speak from my personal experiences have arrived in, uh, in the United States. So it's a, probably a biased perspective because it doesn't assess the whole, the globality of your question. But the issue I had to, 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 to cope with, uh, with the view, not by all Americans, but by a part of the American, especially commentators on, on, about France, is our laicity, our system of relations between state and uh, religions, and the way uh, we um, uh, defend the same core values, for instance, uh, freedom of belief or, or not, freedom of belief or non-belief, Mm -hmm. believe in a, in a religion or equality between uh, men and women uh, we have the same core values uh, no doubt no doubt but we we don't uh, uh, implement these policies to defend those values and to make uh, them re respected by everybody in our societies in the same way so to explain this to American audiences who look at the situation in France through, which is completely normal, by the way, the, the, the reality here in the United yeah. States is a challenge. And uh, I, would say, I would say this is a, the, most, uh, the biggest challenge in this category. And when you're trying to explain America to the French, as you must sometimes have to do, what do you find is the, is the biggest French misunderstanding about America? Well, um, or do they I understand think, us completely? Uh, uh, the, the, the work of uh, the ambassador, embassy, not, a, not only ambassador, my colleagues here, of France to the United States is to explain America to at least a part of our country, which yes. is our government, yes. and also to the many delegations which come to visit us. <laughs> so I hope we succeed in explaining. But of course, the, 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 I would uh, I would say that there are a number of uh, aspects which are um, both positive or uh, maybe more critical, which are uh, very specific in the United States, and uh, which 
I don't know whether we don't understand it, but we try to, to, to better understand it. Sometimes even to, to be um, uh, more effective ourselves, such as the, the, the tech, for instance, the development of the tech, the innovations. Mm -hmm. um, also, but I cannot say it doesn't exist in our societies. We have seen uh, more recently this polarization inside the society, but again, uh, we, we, we have uh, developments in Europe which, uh, which can be compared, but maybe this, this mm -hmm. development are, are looked at with, uh, um, with questions also. Yeah. So again, it's our role to, to try to explain and first to understand. Well, I could ask you questions all, you know, for hours, as you know, as I've done in the past, but um, I think it, it would be unfair not to offer our very patient audience an opportunity to, and, and if you don't have any, I will continue down my list. Tom, and if you would briefly introduce yourselves. Um, I'm Tom Dusterberg, a senior fellow here and work on largely on uh, international economic issues. Um, Mr. Ambassador, you noted several times that the Russian invasion was a game changer, but it's a game changer in more ways than one, I think. Our um, <clears throat> Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, gave a fairly major forward-looking speech yesterday in which she called for, in the words of Bloomberg, challenging China in the moment of choosing on the world order. And she had several suggestions for rethinking the global economic order, which was put into place, what, in the 1950s in the wake of World War II. Specifically, um, and most radically, perhaps, she called for uh, establishing a series of uh, trade agreements. She called them plurilateral agreements among allies, um, clearly aimed, I think, uh, at China but clearly distancing itself from the World Trade Organization. Does France have an early reaction to these uh, suggestions for uh, fairly major changes in, in, in the liberal economic order, rules-based economic order? We, we welcomed the, this administration's decision to come back to a, a multilateral agenda. And a part of it is, uh, was, I remember, one of the first decisions was to, for the U.S. administration, the Biden administration, to, to accept the choice of the new director general of the World Trade Organization, as you can remember. So it, it is a positive, uh, it was for us a positive step because we need the, the, the WTO. We, we understand the difficulties caused by the, the rule of consensus, of course, and the uh, but we, we in Europe, we tend to think that uh, we need the U.S. as a being very active inside those multilateral organizations to um, to fight together for our common interests, both the values, I mean, in human rights, but also in that case uh, for uh, a level playing field where it doesn't exist. So the European Union in, in matters of trade and international economy has adopted recently, and France again has very much pushed in this direction, much more assertive instruments, legal instruments to, 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 to defend in our interests and to, to promote uh, open and open trade and international relation, but based really on a real reciprocity. And we think that we, we, we should uh, use this opportunity because uh, we see that the United States has been doing this under different administrations, both Republican and Democrat, the same, the same way. So we, we think we should, we should really uh, be together, but inside these multilateral organizations. And there is this famous uh, idea and, uh, and the goal of reforming the, those organizations. Because those organizations are not perfect, of course. And we recognize this completely. And we, we recognize also the difficulties. But we must uh, fight inside them to reform them. This is a global uh, trust. And it, it is the same in other organizations, like the World, World Health Organization, to give more teeth in view of future pandemics to the 
to the multilateral rules and so on and so on. Here we are. Now I have not read the proposals uh, presented by uh, Secretary Yellen and I, I cannot comment them because they, they just have been made according to what you said. Uh, we in, in Europe, we, we never saw a contradiction between a plurilateral or even bilateral economic agreements. I mentioned the association agreement with Ukraine, which has a very important economic component, but also a political component. And multilateralism, we, we see this as complementary. And we see also in this respect an opportunity to work with this administration because it seems that we have on both sides of the Atlantic the same concerns, not only about level playing fields in terms of uh, fair competition rules, subsidies, and so on, but also about um, this possible unfair competition situations undermining our own decisions to, uh, especially in the fight of, uh, against climate change and, uh, and undermining our own standards maybe also in social protection, for instance. So we think we have a, a, a feel, a, a good, co and look, look at what, what has been said and decided when we settled, uh, to a certain extent, not completely, the dispute between the EU and the US, which had been started by the Trump administration with higher tariffs on steel and aluminum. We said, okay, we, we, there is this provisory settlement, and there was a statement to say that we would address together, we would discuss together on the best ways to address the issues posed by importing steel from third countries, which is not submitted to the same constraints in terms of uh, the protection of environment and emissions of carbon. So uh, since we have the same concerns and since we have uh, the same goals, I think, uh, to come back to your question, that we can use both uh, uh, agreements or conversations or uh, negotiations as the ones we can have inside the Trade and Technology Council, which we, we have created between the EU and the uh, European Union and the United States, and the multi, multilateral organization which exists and which we must revitalize and, 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 and transform and, and reform, uh, of course, in view of our own interests and goals. We have maybe time for one more question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm Abe Shulsky. I'm a senior fellow here. And I'd like to ask you for your views and your government's views on what kind of structure of European uh, defense might come out of the current crisis. I mean, we've seen the speech by Chancellor Schultz and, and the suggestion that Germany would be playing a much bigger role in the defense uh, arena than it has, and I assume other countries in Europe will also want to be more more active now that <clears throat> they've seen the uh, the, the threat in uh, in Ukraine. But that raises the question of, of whether there has to be a new sort of structure or whether it can be subsumed under the NATO structure. What about the non-NATO members of the EU? And what about the, the tendency towards more cooperation within the EU on, on defense matters? I mean, if, if Europe and the EU is to become sort of more uh, in, not independent, but more concerned about being able to defend itself, then it needs a lot more coordination, it would seem to me, among the mm. 27 members, because uh, it's only by pooling your, your efforts that you'd be able to, uh, to achieve this goal. So I was wondering what sort of thoughts were, were current now about what, how the structures of the defense arrangements in the, within the EU and the NATO and so on might, might have to change? No, thank you for the great question. Uh, well, we have a legal base. We have been four years, four years since the beginning of the 90s. There have been 
even then uh, developed for um, a European security and defense policy. This is not new, but we had to implement this. We have, in the last years, making great progress. For instance, one of these provisions which did exist, which was not implemented, was the so-called uh, structured cooperation, which uh, the, covered by the acronym PESCO, uh, and we have launched a lot of new cooperations in this framework. What is new, and even if it had been prepared before the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, it has, this has been really um, accelerated and deepened by, by the, this, this development, is, and here in this document you, you will find the answers to all your questions, that the leaders, European leaders, have adopted at their last, endorsed at the last summit in March in Brussels, what we call the strategic compass. The strategic compass is the first wide book on defense and security adopted by the European Union as such. And you, you, you will find there the modalities, the concrete modalities, which uh, the European, the EU leaders have decided to, 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 to adopt and to implement uh, to, to give a more, uh, uh, to, to, to take to a new level in developing this EU security and defense policy and identity. Of course, the question is often asked about whether it is uh, uh, compatible with NATO. The answer, of course, is yes. And in a nutshell, and I'm ready to, to go to more, more details if you want, but the, the, what we say, and I deeply, I'm deeply convinced it's, uh, it's not only true, but it's really important, is that to have a, a, a more reliable, stronger, more capable European defense is good both for the United States and for NATO. Uh, which means more money. You mentioned, Walter mentioned Germany, but uh, again, it's happening all mm -hmm. across Europe. More money for our defense, but much more than that, more willingness and more political will and interest to commit troops uh, when you have to engage, and as France is doing already, but uh, as other countries uh, are starting to, to do too, and hopefully will be more and more willing to do, it means uh, more organization. Uh, it means uh, more industrial and technological capacities. Um, so, and it means also, by the way, a stronger and developed and partnership, and strategic partnership between the European Union and NATO to, to organize all of this. It's interesting to see that all of these goals um, capacities, missions, um, partnership with NATO, industrial and technological base, all of these aspects are to be found in the political declaration adopted by President Macron and President Biden in Rome at the end of October, when they met, you know, bilaterally, uh, to, it was a decisive step after the crisis in our bilateral relations uh, created by the announcement of AUKUS uh, mid-September. And they have adopted a very substantial statement, and you will find all of these elements in this statement, in this declaration. And I think it has been very useful uh, in terms of the philosophy I, I, I describe. And again, in this document, which has been adopted, you, you have the concrete answers uh, to, to the question. Great. Well, listen, uh, thanks to the audience here at Hudson. Thanks to those of us who, those of you who are watching online and will watch, because this will stay up on our, our website. Uh, and thanks above all to you, Ambassador Etienne, for, for sharing this time. I just, again, I would like to, to remind our viewers here and online that many countries around the world send their best and their brightest to Washington as ambassadors. And it's a source of wisdom and experience and insight that those of us in the US who like to follow world affairs and foreign policy need to take as much advantage of as we possibly can. So thank you for sharing your thank expertise you. and views today. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you to all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>